Hey friends, Karen Pennington here, and this morning I am struggling with a phrase that probably most of us know and even agree with, and that's the phrase, you can't judge a book by its cover, which is obviously a comment in books, which can be old and tattered or even have weird looking covers, or an old and tattered Bible and can have a wealth of information and insight and wisdom and goodness inside of it, but obviously that extends to translate to people or things or products or you know there's so much that if we stop and say oh that's ugly I won't do it or that doesn't look enticing sometimes we're missing out on a hidden treasure and um, that's a lovely saying it's also frustrating <laughs> let me just get scriptural on you first Samuel 16 7 says the Lord does not look at the things people look at people look at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart so in a sense we can't judge a book by its cover but in a sense we can't not judge a book by its cover we can see what we see until we get to know someone or something we <sighs> how are we gonna do it if we don't know you know what to do let's let's look at a bookstore let's look at a bookstore you go into a bookstore there are probably millions of books right can be overwhelming so are we gonna read every book to figure out whether or not the book is worthy of being read it's really really frustrating so it's like how do we know whether or not to get inside the book to decide whether or not the cover is indicative of what's inside the book it's very frustrating because I'm not God you know I'm not God and I can't read every book and I can't get to know every person and so it really takes a matter of discernment and honestly this is where prayer is so important um and that the people who come across our paths. I mean, no one is not worth God, but we only have 24 hours in a day, and they're not supposed to be evenly distributed among all people. And some people, they're all worth God's time, but let's be honest, they're not necessarily worth our time. If there's somebody who's constantly hating on you, if there's somebody who will refuse, if somebody God says, stay away from them, <laughs> there are people that will pull you further and further into sin and just... You can love them. You're supposed to love them. You can pray for them. That's If they're your enemies, you're supposed to pray for them, you know. But sometimes they're just not worth our time. And how do we tell the difference between the two without getting to know them first? Um, I don't know that I have an answer to that. <laughs> sometimes it's just a matter of asking the Lord and seeking. I will say, as in with a bookstore, there are certain labels that are put in sections. And there are certain covers. And a cover is not the sum total of who the person is. Or what the book is, you know. But sometimes being put in a certain section and given a certain title, it entices you to say, maybe I should know more about this. And there are books with fantastic covers that are horrible books. <laughs> I've had books that seem so enticing and I read the first chapter and I was like, everything this person says I disagree with. Not just I disagree with, it offends me. Um, and then there are books that are old and tattered, you know, 100 years old or um, maybe free or on the clearance rack. I love the clearance rack. And they end up being some of the best books you've ever read. You know, they're hidden treasures. And that's really what I want to talk about today. We could go on and on about, you know, that idea of maybe there's a thought to making sure we present ourselves well. Um, not necessarily over ornate. That could be a different book cover you judge, you know. Um, but kindness, humility, being clean, you know, hygiene. You should love somebody no matter what their hygiene is, but as a, you know, a way of reaching out to others. Maybe when we go to church, make sure we're, we're cleaned up. It doesn't matter if our hair is perfect. It doesn't matter if our clothes are perfect. But more than anything, just presenting ourselves as someone who has love and respect for others and who's a servant to others, that is a cover that people can see. That is an action that can reflect an inner heart. But I don't want to digress too much that I want to talk about hidden treasures. Talk about those things that have such great value. And they may even have value on the surface, but like, you know, those people that you meet them and you're drawn to them and the more you get to know them, the more you just see a treasure in who they are. A lot of times they're the quiet ones. A lot of times they're the humble ones in terms of not having a lot of money, you know? A lot of times they're not the ones that are up on the platform or on the stage or at the pulpit or in the news. There are people in the news that are like that. I'm still pretty fond of Billy Graham. He made the news a lot and yet he maintained a humility about him. Um, it's one of those people that anybody who met him personally just had these great, they were in awe, not of his greatness, but of his humility. And there's that. But the bigger thing is, you know, 
when we're called to do something or led to do something or something just kind of trip into these relationships, sometimes we find hidden treasure. So I really want to talk about hidden treasure in a pretty obvious place. And that was the temple. I was reading about that this morning in uh, 1 Kings 6. And this temple, well, I want to talk about some of the aspects of it first. There were so many riches in this temple, so many riches. And I don't want to bore you with all the details. I'll put that in some of the notes that accompany this um, post and podcast. Uh, but we're getting, the, these figures I'm getting, I'm getting from 1 Chronicles 22, 14, 29, 6, 8, 6 through 8, and 29, 45. I'm coming to these figures with you really quickly on the idea that gold is, uh, as of today in the United States, Gold is worth about $32,000 a pound. Silver is worth about $424 a pound. Bronze is worth about $183 a pound. And iron is worth about $3.75 a pound. Now, what does that mean? What that translates to? And a talent is about 75 pounds. What that translates to is that between what David stored up in the royal treasury for to use for the temple, plus all of his residual fortune, which he donated to the temple, plus everything that the leaders of Israel gave to donate to the temple, we are talking about over a hundred million pounds of precious metal. Over a hundred million pounds. That's over 50 tons. How many trucks would that take? <laughs> Just filled. That doesn't include precious stones that were not were, were mentioned but the count wasn't given that doesn't include bronze iron wood and stone that David had taken from the had um, put into the treasury earmarked it for the use in the temple that were so heavy that you couldn't even weigh them um, just to break it down uh, David himself gave 5,000 oh I'm sorry 3,000 talents of gold 7,000 talents of silver that translates to about 750,000 pounds of precious metal worth about $7.4 billion. I had mentioned previously a few days, a few posts back that um, there was a millionaire who gave $4.1 billion to charity and that was supposed to be the biggest to date contribution. As of the price of gold today, which has gone up quite a bit in a few days, it's more than that now, as of today's price of gold, David would have given $7.4 billion. He then asks the leaders of Israel to freely give. So some of the um, advisors and the leaders of the tribes and the, those sorts of things, the kind of the bureaucracy, I guess. Um, but the leaders in Israel freely gave 5,000 talents of silver, 10,000 talents of gold, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. That... Um, when you put it all together, I'm looking at this, is about 9 million pounds of precious metal that equals about $12.3 billion worth of metal. And then, then, that's not even it. We're only about $12 billion, only $12 billion worth of metals to go in the temple now. And then, David's treasury, between gold and silver alone, had about $272 billion billion dollars worth of metal. So altogether, oh, I'm sorry, 271 billion. Altogether, you have about 200, I'm saying this all wrong, 291 billion, 0.5 billion dollars worth of precious metal. Over 100 million pounds of it. That does not include the stones because we didn't have those weighed and it doesn't include the extra bronze and iron and stone and wood that weren't made in the precious metals. So maybe hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions of pounds, you know, thousands and thousands of tons worth of metal. Now, when I first thought about that, I'm like, that's a lot of treasure, right? I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> that's a lot of treasure. And you would think that much would look great in, in the Met, you know, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art or one of the National History Museums and, and the, the Smithsonian Washington, D. these really big, like tens of thousands of square feet, really high areas. Well, here's the thing about the temple. The main temple 
where people went into, and this is where I get into 1 Kings 6, was 30 feet by 90 feet. That's 2,700 square feet. Can you imagine putting $300 billion worth of metal, worth of, you know, precious metal, inside a room with a couple subrooms that is about the size of either somewhere between two small houses and one mid-sized house. Mid -size house. Two of my houses. I have about 1,300 square feet to my house. So 2,700 square feet. You take two of my houses, put them together, and there are billions, billions, $300 billion worth of metal. Now, some of it went on the walls. You couldn't fit it in there. And if you fit it in there, people couldn't even walk around. How can you worship God? They'd be stepping on everything and be weighed down by it. And no, we also had Solomon's porch, which was just a little bit, 450 square feet. That was outside. So there's a good way to get the stuff taken. You know, put it outside, but maybe back then, maybe not back then, but 450 square feet. So together, it's still only about 3,100, 3,200 square feet, two mid-sized houses, two small to mid-sized houses with that much billions, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of metal. Um, so where did he put it? Um, See, Solomon was smart. <laughs> now, he did listen to his, or at least right now he was. This was one of his wisdom things. He did listen to his father, David, his, who was the architect of this. Solomon added storehouses to the outside of the temple. The three of the area. The front part had his, the Solomon's porch, uh, or the atrium area, or the colonnade, whatever you want to call it. Um, not an atrium, because it was outdoor. But those other three sides had storehouses, and the storehouses went about five feet in width all around the back three sides of the temple on the first floor. And the second floor went six feet in width. And the, and the third floor went seven feet in width. Now, the inside of the temple itself just had a really high ceiling. But so these were like on the outside and they were storehouses. Um, that doesn't seem like that much. You go, oh, five feet in width? That's not a big deal. Six feet in width? That's not a big deal. Seven feet in width? It's not a big deal. You know, and it's funny. Sometimes things look small. But when small things follow around the perimeter, and then there's another layer that falls around the perimeter, then another layer that follows around the perimeter, they become big. So these storehouses, which seem small and insignificant, honestly, before this morning, I wasn't even registering how big they were. I just, they, they tripled the square footage of the temple. These five feet and then six feet and then, I'm sorry, it was five cubits, so 7.5 feet for the first floor. Um, that's like a closet, you know, <laughs> that's a walk-in closet. That's not even a room. And then nine feet, that's a very small bedroom and 10.5, which is a very small living room, you know, that it, it doesn't seem that much, but when you add that all together, you get, um, 6,165 square feet. That's two thirds, literally 66%. <laughs> it doesn't look that big, but it's twice as big as the temple itself. And so that would have been where a lot of the treasure was. That would have been where some of the lampstands were. It would have, they were big closets so that they had, I mean, this is really, I'd love to have a closet that big. I don't have enough closet space. So even the temple itself, you almost couldn't judge the book by its cover because you'd see, you know, Solomon's porch, which would have been beautiful and glorious. You would have walked in. You would have seen silver overlaying walls. You would have seen golden lampstands. You would have seen the basin. And you would have seen even part of that temple that people could be in, the, the courtyard and everything. You couldn't go to the holy place or the most holy place, which were the parts only the priest and then the high priest once a year could go. But you would see glory, but you had no idea how much. You had no idea how much hidden treasure was there. You had no idea. Uh, King Hezekiah did. He got a little cocky about it. And, you know, these things, they were holy. They were meant for God. They were meant for certain people to see. There are things of God that they say are hidden from some and are hidden in us. And there's a time to reveal them. Not that we ever keep them a secret like we hide them like we're ashamed of them. But there are things about our faith and our faith journey 
Um, there are things about our struggle that maybe we don't always stand up and share in all places. There are things about what we're going through right now, you know. Sometimes people don't need to know all this stuff about your medical history, you know. And then there are things that are just so precious, these intimacies that should be shared only with close friends, close relatives. There are things about myself. I'm very open. I'm so very open. I'm an open book. But there are still moments that are meant just for my husband or just for my family or just for my close friends, particularly just for my husband. And there were these storehouses that were meant for certain things. And um, King Hezekiah, who most of the time was a pretty good king. I'm trying to look it up here because I have it. Um, he got a little cocky. King Hezekiah, God, um, he had been under attack by Sennacherib and he was an Assyrian leader and because God is gracious I mean this was the greatest army of the time God sent one angel which just floored this army that really by all rights should have been able to take over Jerusalem and then Hezekiah got sick and so God gave him victory and then God gave him wellness and God said I'm going to give you 15 more years so what did Hezekiah do he started showing off he started saying look at my stuff um, just a year or two after the Assyrians came to take everything that was his, another set of Assyrians came and said, oh, we just want to wish a good girl. So, well, so what did he do? He showed off all the stores. He showed off everything in the temple. He showed off these hidden treasures. And that was part of the downfall of Israel. God didn't make it come in his lifetime, but according to Isaiah... This is 2 Kings 20. According to Isaiah, uh, he said, he's going to, this is all going to be taken away. You showed it off. You tried to look good. You tried to say how powerful I am. These people that you showed off to, they're going to take everything. About 100 years later, King Nebuchadnezzar, totally new dynasty, took everything. And trash, didn't just trash the storehouses, it trashed the temple itself. Friends, let's be careful how we're showing our treasures and who we're showing them to. We do have that part of us that should shine, that Solomon's, that Solomon's porch, you know, that part of us that should just reflect God's glory, not look at me, but look at God, that part that stands up on a hill and people see that and want to be part of it. We have that part of us that as people enter into our lives, we share more and more. We share our stories. There are stories that I share publicly, and there's a lot of them because I'm a fairly open book, and there are stories that have to do with people very close to me, things that I'm going through, or other people's stuff that I only show and share in intimate settings. And then there's treasures. And then, on the other side, it says, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this most all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are the temple of God. We may not be flashy. Maybe we're not supposed to be flashy. We may be clay. We're very useful. <laughs> we're a useful means to be a container and a recipient and a sharer of God's very weighty, just like the temple treasury, very valuable glory. You know, glory actually means weight. It's a weightiness. So we're containing the weight of God's glory in a good way, in a valuable way. And, you know, others have it too. Isn't it just, it's not really a lesson, it's just an encouragement. Isn't it just awesome when you meet somebody and you don't know what to think about them? Maybe good, maybe bad, but those people that, they surprise you. You know, you didn't necessarily think something bad or good about them. Maybe they're quiet. Maybe they're real unassuming. Maybe they seem kind of humble. And then you just find this treasury of wisdom. You see their storehouses. When we get to know the Lord, when we allow him to enter, when we enter the most holy place with him, then our temple, it's not just about what people see from the outside. It's not even about how people enter. There is a treasure of worth. There's a treasure of glory in us that God enables us to have. But never should we get cocky and say, look at, look at me. I, <laughs> I'm preaching to me here because you know I like to be right. And you know that I like to say, look at this awesome thing I have.
have, you know, and, but there's a difference. It's not, look at what I've done. Look at how great I am. It's, and I need to, again, say that to myself, but look at what God is in me. You do that, you, you do it not to show yourself off, but when it's right to share a treasure, an intimate treasure, hidden treasures. And God blesses it and God increases it. And God is God. And somehow we can get more and more the more we share. And somehow God enables us by grace to even receive the weight of his glory. It is weighty. It is overwhelming. It is a blessing. And God wants to give it to us. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for hidden treasures. Thank you for the books that may seem one way and we read them and they're just amazing. Thank you for the people that share hidden treasures in the right ways. Thank you for your temple and what a and that we're your temple, Lord Jesus. God, you have so many riches for us. And they're your riches. You have so much honor for us, God. And it's your honor. And I want to be part of that. I want to be part of your splendor. And I want to remember that it's your splendor, God. I want to remember my place. Help me to stay humble. Help us all to stay humble. And that we receive your glory. And we reflect your glory. And we take joy in being part of all of that but always understand it's about you, God. Bless us all and somehow make these words I'm saying, these facts, <laughs> come to life for others as you had for me, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. Be blessed, my friends.